start to melt. So I'm going to start to see this intrusive body kind of consume and incorporate the country rock as it melts its way through. Now, if the country rock is made of rock with higher melting temperatures than the temperature of the magma, that's not going to happen, is it? The magma might make its way along some cracks and some fissures, but it's not going to melt the country rock. So it's kind of a combination of both of these going on. But regardless, that hot magma sitting there next to that country rock, that surrounding rock, is going to heat up the edges where it's in contact. And that means some of that heat is going to be working on that country rock, baking that contact zone. So we see with the country rock, we end up with what we call a baked zone right along the contact zone where the magma is. Likewise, that country rock is absorbing some of the heat of the, the magma and as that magma cools off right there at the contact, it's changing the temperature of the magma right there. It's cooling it off, and we call that a chill zone. So the country rock's getting heated up, the edge of the magma is getting cooled down, so we have a baked zone on the country rock and a chill zone on the magma. Now, why should I care about that? Well, remember we said that we weren't going to get a fine-grained rock at depth unless I could cool it off quickly? Well, here's where I can cool it off quickly, for just a little bit, just right at the chill zone. I can maybe cool it off a little faster. So I might see this rock that, for the most part, is coarse-grained rock here. But right at this chill zone, right along the edge, the grain size changes. It's fine grain because it got chilled and cooled off quickly. So that's kind of cool. Likewise, this country rock is getting heated up real high temp right at the contact along the baked zone. And now I've got a high temperature situation where I'm going to start changing some of the original makeup of that country rock. I'm not melting it. I'm not getting it that hot. But I'm getting it hot enough that the minerals that make up that rock don't like it. They're out of equilibrium, and they're going to start to change. So I'm going to see some metamorphism going on in that baked zone. And we'll kind of come back to this a little more when we talk, talk about metamorphic rocks. So I've got some changes going on right at this contact that uh, you know kind of let me know there's a contact there. Another thing that might happen is some of the pieces of country rock might break off from the country rock and fall into the melted magma. And then it melts and becomes part of the magma, changing the chemistry right in that area. But then as it moves around and you know, moves to the system, it kind of gets mixed in. But what happens if I'm right at the end of the process? A chunk of the country rock breaks off, falls into the magma, gets incorporated in the magma, and that's as far as it gets. It doesn't get melted. It just remains as a piece of country rock in the magma. But now the magma cools off. It becomes the pluton. But within the pluton, I now have chunks of country rock. There's a great cross-cutting relationship, right? Remember when we talked about putting things in relative order? I know the country rock had to be older than the intrusion because I had to have country rock to intrude into, right? So it gives me that order. But we call these little chunks of rock that didn't get melted, we call them xenoliths with an X, but you pronounce it like a Z. So xenoliths are something you look for, and that cross-cutting relationship helps you determine which rock came first. They're pretty handy things to have. And as you might guess, they are totally surrounded by this hot magma. There's probably going to be some metamorphism going in on in those, those um, uh, xenoliths. They're going to get changed some. They're probably not going to be purely country rock with no change. That's kind of a little unusual. 
So some terms that you need to kind of be aware of. Sometimes the country rock, the original rock that we start with, um, that makes up the country, sometimes that's also referred to as the host rock because it's hosting the intrusion as that comes into it. So uh, a couple of terms that are pretty standard and you ought to be familiar with. Okay. But one thing that I kind of look for on the surface that is an old pluton at death would be a volcanic neck. And in this case, I've got this big volcanic cone that forms. The vent that was coming up plugged off with magma. And the magma, it's hard, it's solid, it's not rubbly and cindery like the cone. So it's more durable. It's also protected by the cone, so it's the last thing that's going to get eroded and weathered. So what I see is, over time, the cone kind of gets worked on. It starts disappearing. Weathers, material breaks down, the products carried away by the, the streams. And eventually what's exposed is that magma that's now hardened under that volcanic plug. And that's the last thing still sticking up. So these volcanic necks oftentimes are the, the last remnants of a volcano. And they were somewhat plutonic in their origin, but now they're the thing exposed to the surface. And shiprock is one of those big, giant volcanic necks. You can see it here in the countryside. Here's the big neck. This is the this is the, the neck right here, you can see that. And this is the way the volcano used to look with the cone all over this plug. And now all the cone is gone, you see the plug, and you can see where the magma was coming up through a couple of other little spots here and there, trying to make its way up. As the main vent plugged off, pressure was trying to push that magma up through other little openings. Here's Devil's Tower in Wyoming. Beautiful example of a volcanic neck. The entire cone is gone, but this magma that was going up the, the vent and hardened there is the thing that still remains. Another thing that we see when we look at shiprock besides the neck are these long walls. You can see one here, you can see one right here. Here's one of these walls. It's the end of this one here. You can see how well it sticks out in this picture. And here's a person for scale standing at the end of one of these walls. And these are nothing more than cracks that were running from, through the vent, through the cone. And notice how they kind of move out radially from the cone in a kind of a spoke fashion. So the, the neck itself is right there at the center. Then you've got these cracks that are running out from it, and they're filling with magma, and they're forming these, these remnant walls, what we call a dike. Kind of looks like the dikes they build around Holland to keep the seawater out. And you can just see these things, these big vertical walls running uh, all along there. Here's a dike, it's not totally straight up and down, but you can see how it's cut up through these layered sedimentary rocks here. You can see this intrusive plutonic dike cutting through. Notice the raft guys down here in the river for scale. Or here's one. This is a beautiful example of one just cutting up through the countryside. This one's almost vertical. And you can see how wall-like it looks. But that was just magma filling in a crack in the, in the system uh, when it was down at depth. Now, what happens if that crack, instead of being vertical or sub-vertical, was more horizontal? And here you can see a case. You can see some bedded limestones down here, and you can see some bedded sandstone limestones up here. And look at this guy here. This is all igneous. And here, it's intruded along here, kind of forcing its way in along a bedding plane 
kind of pushing the top beds up, squirting in under pressure, moving horizontally along between these bedded units. You can see there's kind of another episode of it down here. Now, instead of calling it a dike, we call it a sill. Think in terms of window sill that runs across the bottom of a window, flat lateral sill. But the same thing's happening. It's a plutonic intrusive body where that hot magnet is forcing its way along this opening, and we've got the sill form. So, how do I know that that's an intrusive body? How do I know that flat line body was a sill that formed by that magma being forced along between those bedding planes? How do I know it wasn't a lava flow on the surface just flowing across the top of the land and then some more sediment came down and built some more rocks on top of it? How can I tell the difference? Cross-cutting. Cross-cutting relationships, okay. What would I look for in cross-cutting relationships? Would you be able to, like in the picture, would you be able to actually see that? I like in real life. Yeah. Look for well, it was there at the beginning one. Yeah, the well, let, let's look at these two contacts. Here we have this sill. And you can see how it's intruded. It was originally flat, but the whole area's been tilted up a little bit in some later deformation. And let's look at the upper and lower contact. Is that magma's moving along? it's going to be picking up some material of the bed that it's traveling on top of, right? So if it's a flow, I would expect to see inclusions along the bottom here within that magma of the underlying rock. So I'd see little bits and pieces of that underlying rock that have been picked up and incorporated in the magma, just like xenoliths in a way. If it were a lava flow, I wouldn't see any at the top contact, would I? Because that would have just been there. I'd only have picked up material from the rock that it was traveling over. And I'd probably see a grain size change from coarser at the bottom to finer at the top, because the top would have been cooling off a lot faster, being exposed to the atmosphere. But here, I would expect to see no grain size change between between the top and the bottom. I might see a chill zone on each side, but I wouldn't expect to see a gradational change of coarse bottom, fine top. And I'd look for inclusions along the surface, too, because it was just as possible to be picking up stuff from the overlying unit as it was from the underlying unit. So this idea of cross-cutting relationships, looking for inclusions, I'd expect to see them on both sides if it was a sill, and only the bottom, if it were a flow. So there are a number of things I can kind of look for that go right along with the basic principles we've been talking about, about whether it was extrusive cooling off quickly, what it was picking up along the way, or whether it was intrusive cooling off slowly and becoming coarse grains. Here we've got a pretty cool picture. This is uh, up in Antarctica. And you can see this big dark unit here. This is a big sill. You can see how it's kind of intruded along these fractures and bedding planes connected by these fractures. And if I draw this out, this is kind of what it looks like here. And you can see how this is just squirted on in and just found all the weaknesses. Went from one bedding plane to the next. And at the very top, we see another sill. But in this case, it's all been eroded, and now it's closed to the surface. So I would be really kind of a little concerned about this upper unit. Was it a sill or a flow? So I'd be looking for all of those kinds of things to look for. To, to, you know, This is pretty obvious here, but that top one, you know, just kind of check that out a little bit. How many of you have ever been out uh, to New York and gone along the Palisades Parkway? 
north of New York City, up to New Jersey area. Well, this is what it looks like. It's this big, steep, sharp wall with the Hudson River running right along. This was a big, huge, intrusive sill. And you can see that sill here. And it was in place. The whole area was tilted a little bit. And then the river cut down through. And this is the end of the edge of the sill where the river cut through it. But what's really cool about this is when you look at this sill, it changes in composition. And you can see Bowen's reaction series there. At the bottom, there's this chilled zone sitting on the sedimentary rock. That's kind of what you'd expect. At the top, there's a chilled zone so with the overlying sedimentary rock. So you know it's a sill, right? Chilled zones, top and bottom. And at the bottom, it's rich in olivine. At the top, it's mostly plagia clays, no olivine. Ah, there's our settling fractionation thing going on again, isn't it? The sill gets squirted in there, that magma comes in. The first thing that starts to form as it cools is olivine there at the top of Bowen's reaction series, and it starts to settle out. It accumulates at the bottom of the sill, and as the sill continues to cool, the stuff near the top is going to be olivine deficient, silica rich. And that's the way it freezes in place. So I've got chill zones to tell me it was a sill, and I've got this change in composition from olivine up to silica rich showing me how it cooled off. That's kind of neat. Okay, so we've already talked about a couple of the terms that we use for plutons. The idea of a batholith, which originally in place at depth, but then exposed at the surface. The idea of calling it a stock if it's less than 100 square kilometers. But there are a couple of other things. We've talked about a dike being a semi-vertical type of wall, a sill being more of a horizontal type of, type of feature. Notice here how this dike feeds this sill. So oftentimes, you see these things in conjunction with one another. But let's talk about a couple of specific types of sills, a lopolith and a lacolith. Okay. One looks like a mushroom. This lacolith kind of looks like a mushroom. This lopolith looks more like kind of a inverted umbrella, like the wind got to it. What's the deal? Notice they're both being fed by a couple of dikes bringing <coughs> igneous rock up. And it hits a layer where it's easier for this stuff to start spreading out along the bedding plane rather than to keep cutting up through the through the rock. And it does that. And as it does that, it continues to do that. You'll notice it kind of is doing it down here. It breaks through, and here it continues to spread out. And now we see that the, the magma is sticky enough, so it just kind of keeps building up right around the point where it's being injected through the dike. And it's tougher for it to spread out. So it kind of builds up in this mushroom shape thing. So we usually see that with magmas that are more silica rich. Here, with a lapolith, it started to fill out and spread up. But notice how it sags back down into the, into the dike? What we see there is when the pressure dropped, all of the magma that went out here was still pretty fluid, low viscosity, and it kind of ran back down the vent, down the dike. So we tend to see this form with magmas that are more basalt-like, less viscous, and kind of runnier. So it's just kind of a function of the viscosity of the material that's building 
today. And the, uh, the, uh, so, 